modified aspect of personality and consolidate it more in order to, to develop a healthy sense of self. Okay, so in order to reach, the, to, to be able to cultivate the insight into non-self, one first needs a healthy and well-developed sense of self. And then when one overcomes the idea of the at atta, the self spoken of in Buddhism, then one becomes free from self in the healthy or wholesome way. I saw, I saw a hand floating. Neil? Yeah. Um, take, take the other. The, the previous, one of the questions from online got me thinking. If, if the Buddha actually never said there is no self, yeah. but instead encouraged one not to see the aggregates as self, yeah. Is it possible that he meant to say, these are not self, but something else is? No, no, because he also re re repeatedly rejects somebody's attempt to posit a self outside or beyond the aggregates. I think one can, inf what I would say is that one can infer from things that the Buddha said that he doesn't accept the idea of a metaphysical self at all. I think um, Andrea wants to say something. Thanks for bringing that up because I want, there's like a whole internet debate, just raging debate on that. And you have people who are hysterical, I mean really hysterical in their arguments. Uh, and they use that to even further posit the idea of self by saying, well, he never said that. Yeah. So I wanted you to really clarify that. So thanks, Neil. Yeah, I, keep, really away. <laughs> I keep away from internet debates. I'm no, really... but I mean, it's, cause this is going to get on in the internet that's important. And, I wanted you to yeah. go over that a bit further because I could just see. Well, Vicky Wang said it. Yeah, wow. And everybody knows I have to be extremely careful of everything I say here. Well, no, but, you, but then when you come up with a rejoinder, because, yeah, you know, um, they, they just go nutters over that. So, ergo, you know, ipso facto, there must be a soul or an Atman. And, yeah. But it, it, mm, next is the great rebirth debate, but that's not for this one. <laughs> Maybe you take the microphone. Some of the past I I think I saw Sutta which talks about um, a person asks the Buddha if there is a self. Yeah. And the Buddha um, gave him the answer. I mean a sutta about And the Buddha gave him the answer. It gave him the answer like uh, I forgot where I saw it, but it's like uh, he he taught everything like um, five aggregates. How can you still think there is a self? Mm -hmm. It's something like that. I'm not sure. Oh, maybe. I do saw something like that. I'm not sure. I have to think which. I I have to see which sutta that is. But there is a sutta where one wanderer comes to the Buddha, his name is Vachagotama, and he asks the Buddha, is there a self, Master Gotama? And then the Buddha remains silent. And then Vachagotama says, is it the case then that there is no self? And again, the Buddha remains silent. Yeah, so. Then this wanderer walks away, and then Ananda, asked the Buddha, why did you remain silent in both cases? Then the Buddha said that, maybe this is what you're thinking of, if I said that there is a self, would that be consistent with my teaching that all phenomena are non-self? So then, Ananda says, that's the case, you know, it would have been inconsistent. And then the Buddha says, if I taught that there is no self, then this wanderer is very, already very confused. And so he would have wondered, before I had a self, and now the teacher Gotama says, I have no self. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw the sutta too. So is that the one you were thinking of? Uh, I don't think they are the same one. Mm. Okay, I'll try to think of the one. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. 
That doesn't really speak so much about the five aggregates. That's more to reject the idea that it's the same self that wanders on from life to life. If I can just make a comment, I just think a lot of this debate, of, oh my God, is it, it's not really even a proper question to ask if there's a self because it just further enforces the idea of self that's besides the point of the Buddha Dhamma. Yeah, no, yeah. It's trying to teach. Yeah. It just gets people totally away because now you're seeking to just attach yeah. onto an idea of self, we'll see. Yeah. Either an idea of self or else there'll be those who militantly take up the idea, there is no self. And either way, whether you're, whether, because they're really, they don't get it, but they're either being eternalists or nihilists. They're actually yeah. going down this yeah. path because you either think there is a self or you think there is, you know, something to be got rid of. Either way, you're putting in something and that's totally against the point of the, the Buddhist coming. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems to me the Buddha, his teaching is designed to eliminate, it's actually the clinging, clinging to things as being I, mine, and myself. And so what, what is it that we cling to? Basically the five aggregates are also exter, external things. So the Buddha says, see all dhammas, all phenomena. Our condition. Excuse me? Our condition. Yeah, yeah. So, see all phenomena, either the five aggregates or external things, see them as not mine, not I, not myself. And when one develops that insight, it removes the clinging. And so that's the cure that the Buddha is aiming at, is the removal of the clinging. But I think one of the problems, especially in Western countries, um, you know, they don't really teach by the Socratic method anymore. I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. they, we want to be spoon fed, we want to be told what it is. And he didn't teach that way. He taught in a negative fashion to get people yeah. to think for yeah. to get people to think for themselves. And that's a problem because especially in Western culture, well what is it? What's the answer? Yeah. He didn't yeah. teach like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Somebody uh, I think Neil has some question. Yeah, I was just gonna add that. Take take again, okay, take the microphone. I was just gonna add that um, there was an implication in how you answered that question that I think was important, which is that the Buddha didn't treat it philosophically. There yeah. is or is not a self. He treated it very practically. Exactly. And I have a teacher who always says, um, just sit on the cushion and look at the, as you look at the five aggregates, see if you can find a self. Mm -hmm. If you can, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically that's what he's doing. He's just, you know, telling us to see yeah. for ourselves. Yeah if we can look inside of this, this being yeah. and find that kind okay. of self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, take it again. Again, take the microphone. Oh, yeah. I know next to nothing about all of this because I'm just a, yeah. a very beginner. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if all of this is, is somehow, it sounds to me anyway, and probably my misperception, this all begins to sound very metaphorical. Even the idea of a self um, sounds uh, as if he's talking about um, something in met some metaphorical kind of way rather than some literal kind of way. I mean, we're talking about all of this in a very literal sense. There is a, there is a self, or he was talking about a self. Perhaps he was talking about something somewhat different. I, I, I don't know what that would be, but it doesn't, it doesn't sound as, you know, as if it's something that's that, that's, that's, that's literal, that exists in the way that he, he was talking about it. Well, right, so I'm not making myself clear. Unless you I mean, the, 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 there's this, there is a self, there is a self. It goes back and forth. You know? Well, that is sort of the questions, or one of the questions that was discussed and debated amongst all of the thinkers and religious teachers in the Buddha's time. And then the Buddha spoke about this, this whole debate of there is a self, there isn't a self. He calls it like the wilderness of views, the desert of views, the thicket of views. But the idea of, for people who have the idea of self, <laughs> including those on the internet who say there is no self, you idiot. David Hume also agreed that there 
wasn't any experience of the self. So yeah. I, if I examine my own experience, what I yeah. see is uh, bundles of yeah. ideas in two different types. Uh, yeah. One external, large, clear, forceful ones, and yeah. faint, imaginary, yeah. memory ones, right? Yeah. And we said, it, but you don't experience the self. But that means that the self is not experienced. That's not quite the same thing as saying that the self doesn't exist. Yeah. Because you could say, okay, so what the self is, is the thing that does the experiencing. Yeah. In other words, yeah. right? That is that, that, that you don't have to say, well, I experience or I don't experience the thing that does the experiencing. That you don't have to make that decision. There are some things which we acknowledge exist yeah. without experiencing that. In the way, for instance, like mathematics and such, like the yeah. rules of logic, you don't have to think that you're going to experience a rule of logic in order to be forced logically to acknowledge that it exists. And so the problem there is, I think, the idea of existence. That is, the assumption is that the existing, that existence is only something which one experiences. And so, you know, we, you, you don't always use that idea of existence, right? That is, there are contexts in which you don't, for instance, yeah. in, you know, logic and mathematics and different yeah. areas of philosophy. Right? Yeah. And so, what you're saying is not, the, the Buddha is not necessarily, that is, in not necessarily claiming either that self exists or that it doesn't exist, yeah. what he seems to be claiming or closest to claiming, is that it's not experienced. That that's a little different from the claim that it doesn't exist, given that existence has a number of different meanings. And that's a good point. In fact, there's a statement that's in Sutta number 22. This is about as close as one could find to a denial of the self in the Buddha's teaching. But it's not phrased in terms of existence, but in terms of what is found or apprehended. Let me see if I can get the page. Okay, this is on page 232. It's par Sutta number 22, paragraph number 25. Okay, the Buddha is speaking to a monk, and he says, or to the monks, and he says, because there being a self, would there be for me what belongs to a self? In other words, if a, there is a self, then there's something which belongs to a self. That would be if I posit a self, then we could say the five aggregates belong to the self, or external things literally belong to the self. Okay, so the monk says, yes. Then the Buddha says, or else, if there is what belongs to a self, then would there be for me a self? So yes. So in other words, self and what belongs to a self are interdependent notions. Then he says, since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended or not found as true and established, then the standpoint for views, namely that which is the self is the world, after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, and so on, doesn't that become an utterly and completely foolish teaching? Okay, so the point that I want to make here is that the Buddha doesn't quite say that since a self and what belongs to a self doesn't exist. You know, he just puts aside the question of existence and he says that a, a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended, they're not discovered, not found as true and established. So then that becomes a reason for 
putting aside all views of self. Okay. Sorry, I just want to ask one, one more question. Yeah. Very often we, we talk about somebody, uh, very often a good person, as being selfless. Okay. <coughs> what does that mean in reference to, in, in regard to, to, to what the Buddha was talking about? Okay, we speak about a person in ordinary language as being selfless. Yes. I would say that in the case that that person has a very attenuated sense of the ego self in the negative sense. That the person is willing to do things for the sake of others, very helpful, very generous, self-sacrificing. We would say this person has a very highly developed sense of empathy with others. Um, and so what I would say is that a person like that, who has a character like that, would have a very strong basis for developing the insight into selflessness. Though it doesn't necessarily mean that such a person has already reached that, that insight. But it's, say, they're working along on parallel lines, the parallel lines that could meet at a certain point in the future. And then, of course, if a person overcomes the sense of self through insight, then that person will be spontaneously selfless in their behavior. Okay, I just want to take the last internet question, then we'll um, disband for lunchtime. Okay, the question says, some part of karma is very hard to explain without some sort of carrier something to carry that karma. <laughs> yeah, this was a question, in fact, that the Buddha schools face. Because the Buddha d doesn't deal with that question explicitly. Oh, I see, this is a continuation. Is there a carrier of karma? Is the carrier a permanent entity? What is the nature of this carrier from life to life? <laughs> Let me just say that different Buddha schools found it began to speculate over this question, what is it that carries the karma? And probably the dominant view is that there's no entity that carries the karma from moment to moment and from life to life, but there is a kind of stream or sequence of momentary acts of consciousness, and the stream of karma is just like a collection of potentials within that stream of consciousness which is passed on from moment to moment within the stream of consciousness. Then when the right conditions come together, then the karma bears its, brings its results. But there's no entity which is the carrier of the karma. But other schools weren't satisfied with that and some posited a kind of consciousness was called the Alaya Vijnana which is, again, it's a stream rather than a lasting entity, but it's a stream that continues on preserving its identity from life to life, um, and it carries the seeds of karma. Okay, this is just a continuation of the question. Okay, I think we'll end now, and we will have a class again next Saturday, the 29th, and we'll try to finish the sutta the next, next week. <laughs> I thought to myself this morning, well, I should be able to finish the sutta today. <laughs> but I think it's important to discuss the questions that arise from this passage. Okay, we'll end with the sharing of the merits. So we share the merits of listening to the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma. We share that with the Devas. Buddhas or fair spirits and other sense beings. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyanta manumo dipa chirang rakanto de sena. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyanta manumo dipa. She ran rakantu de sanam akasa ta chabumata
Deva Nagam Hedika Punyata Nanamodipa Shivam Rakantu Mahum Param E Tavatacha Amhehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sade Deva Nomodantu Sada Sampati Siddhya E Tavatacha Amhehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sade Buddha Nomodantu Sada Sampati Siddhya E Tavatacha Amhehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Satanu Modantu Sava Sampati Siddhya Pavagupadaya Vichitato E Tantare Satakai Papana Rupia Rupicha Sanya Sanino Tu Kapamu Chantu Pusan Tu Nibuti Thanks. 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 Thanks.